All right, so welcome everyone. My name is Melanie. I'm a student here at Tufts and I'm part of the uh, planning committee for our year symposium. Uh, so welcome all to our spotlight on solutions on how to make labs more sustainable. Uh, the session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. So please modify your name and or shout off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. Um, we ask that all attendees keep their audios off unless prompted during the question and answer period. So at the end of the presentation, we'll have some time for questions that you can post on the Q&A feature, or you can raise your hand and we can uh, call on you. So um, we will be finishing the session 10 minutes before the hour to allow for a short break between uh, before the next session. All right, so it's my honor to introduce our next speaker, Jennifer Ballou. Jennifer Ballou works as a sustainability project planner for the climate uh, team at the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, primarily focusing on local energy use and emissions reduction ordinance. Prior to transitioning to a role in uh, government climate action, she worked for 15 plus years as a scientist turned sustainability professional. Lever leveraging her experience in biotech to work in impactful ESG oriented roles at MIT and at My Green Lab. She founded a local working group in 2018 called Cambridge Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Labs, which has 150 plus members from over 30 local organizations and meets regularly to discuss topics and strategies related to resource cons conservation in laboratories. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah, take it away. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie, for having me. And um, really nice to meet all of you guys. Let me go ahead and get my screen sharing before I forget to do that. Um, but yeah, as Melanie, can you guys, is that good? You can see it? Okay. As Melanie noted, um, I am a scientist turned um, sustainability advocate, recently turned to the dark side government worker. Um, I've, I've been a little bit all over the map in my career thus far, but always focusing on uh, sustainable efforts. So um, yeah, really excited to, to come here today and talk to you guys about sustainable labs. Again, this was like, I, I loved my job at MIT a few years back doing exactly this, going to um, groups of whether it's um, you know, PIs, postdocs, grad students, all the way, you know, lab managers, anyone who had anything to do with labs and giving them, um, you know, a really important overview of why it's so important to, to really focus on sustainability in a laboratory setting and, and the different um, considerations that you have to really keep in mind when you, when you are working in a lab. So um, I'll just, I'll preface this a little bit by saying I, um, I put this, this is very much a Frankenstein presentation. Um, when they contacted me, I was like, oh, this is great. I have so much information. I'll just like put all these presentations together. And so I, I did a lot of that, just like copy pasted over stuff that I thought was relevant and applied the same design to all of the slides. And um, so I just apologize if I, if, you know, get to a point and I'm like, oh, this is the slide that I'm on now. Okay, we'll talk about that. <laughs> but um, you know, I always, you know, feel free to, to ask questions if I'm not clear on things, but hopefully you'll, um, you'll get something out of this. So just to start with a real quick agenda, um, hope to tell you guys a little bit more about why we need green labs or sustainable labs, um, dive into energy and waste um, a little more specifically, talk about safety and sustainability, because that's a, a really important relationship, and then um, go into sustainable labs in Cambridge. And again, I'll try and keep it to the 30 to 40 minute time presentation so that we have plenty of time to, to chat about things. Um, so why do we need to green our labs? Um, so this is an interesting question and I think it's it's maybe especially interesting considering this audience. Like I, I imagine that for, um, for nutrition, nutrition scientists and nutrition students, you, you probably have how do I want to say this? Less of you are probably as involved with what we think of as a, a typical wet lab space, you know, like the, the beaker Muppet who's wearing the white coat and pipetting with the goggles all day and things are exploding in the background. Um, that might not be your reality, even if you're doing, um, you know, nutrition science. But I imagine quite a few of you do have um, some overlap and involvement with laboratories. 
And, you know, I'm a good example of how your career can change <laughs> throughout life. So just because you're not in the lab now doesn't mean you won't be later. Um, the, it's definitely a booming industry, especially around Boston. Um, so energy, water resources, and um, chemicals are really the big ways that we waste things in labs. And um, just a few snippets, um, lab buildings consume, I would say, at least 10 times the energy of a typical building um, and use a ton of, of single-use plastic. I actually just heard another recent statistic that um, plastic from the medical and biotech industry is actually one of the very few still increasing sectors. Like a lot of people are cutting down on their plastic, but medical and biotech, it's, it's just going through the roof because we use so much disposable materials. So um, there are really a lot of considerations and they're pretty varied as to why it's important to, to think a lot about sustainability in a lab. But um, so we'll just, we'll jump into the first one, which is energy. And I'm, I'm gonna start with energy, even though a lot of people, if they had their druthers would start with waste <laughs> because um, it, it's funny, like, and, and I, I say this because I, I myself years ago, um, you know, when I was first working in labs, even when I was first managing a lab at Harvard and getting involved with their sustainability team, my, my brain's thought of like, how can I be sustainable was recycle. We need to recycle things, recycling, recycling, oh, the waste, the things we throw away. Um, and, and not saying that that's not important, but truly the, the energy that, um, that lab spaces use tend to be so much more impactful than, um, than the, the waste is. Again, it's a little, it depends on how you dice it and measure it, but, um, but it's very important. So I'm gonna start with that just because it might be something that those of you with lab experience haven't thought as much about. I won't really touch on lighting because you know, if this was gonna be a 45 minute presentation on just energy, sure. But um, lighting, convert to LED. That's, that's your <laughs> long and short of it. You just need to get more efficient lights. But um, HVAC and plug load are two really big ones that we'll, we'll dive into. So this, um, and this specifically, I used to have multiple presentations that were HVAC focused. I could talk 45 minutes to an hour and a half easily just on, on air in labs. So um, I'll try and cut this down to a few slides here. Um, and, and typically during a lot of presentations, when back when we were all in person, I would start this by saying, you know, raise your hand if you know what HVAC stands for. And um, especially in academic lab kind of situations where, you know, not a lot of people even own a house yet, there would like maybe be one hand like, that knows what that means. But um, so HVAC, heating, ventilation, and cooling, it's basically just the buildings that are moving around air to keep to keep the air inside um, comfortable and safe. So in a typical office building, um, this this um, icon or this picture represents more of what you see in a typical office building, um, which probably none of us are sitting in right now. We're all sitting in our houses, but pretend you were sitting in an office building. Um, it, the building management system, which is like the basically the brains of, of your building, really only has to think about the temperature and um, the humidity, and then also keeping up with the general air change per hour rate. And that's more or less to keep the air fresh so that if you have pizza in the conference room at lunch, it doesn't smell like pizza all day. It's just sort of like freshening the air in the space. Um, but when you get to a laboratory space that that same building management system has a lot, lot, lot more considerations um, to, to keep the, the space not only comfortable, but safe. So temperature and humidity are still part of it, but um, air change per hour requirements are suddenly regulated by things like ASHRAE and OSHA and have to be much, much higher um, to, to ensure that, that in case of any kind of a chemical spill or any sort of like a, an airborne toxin that might happen in a lab, um, <clears throat> the air is clearing quickly enough to keep everybody safe. <clears throat> and there are also usually, excuse me, there are also usually other safety measures like evacuation buttons and things you can hit, but generally speaking, they want the air change rate to be much higher um, excuse me, for general safety. Um, so up to six to 12 um, air changes per hour, which might not sound like a lot, but it's actually quite a bit, especially for a large high ceiling space. You have increased exhaust through things like chemical hoods, which again, if you haven't worked in a lab, you might not have a lot of experience with them. I'll go into it in a second. And um, <clears throat> snorkels, so little tubes that come down from the ceiling and suck air out of a specific spot. 
You also have a lot more heat in that room. So if you think about in an office, you're sitting next to a printer, it's not putting off a whole lot of heat, but lab equipment, like specific um, research lab equipment runs at a much higher temperature, it typically takes up a lot, um, a lot more wattage. So it, it puts out a lot more heat. Um, there are also pressure requirements in a lab. So um, for example, if you have a chemical spill, you want the, the room to be negatively pressurized, i.e. like room is, the air is kind of being sucked into the space so that that chemical that you spill doesn't get pushed out into the hallways. You wanna always make sure you're pulling up so much air that it's pulling in more than the hallways are to keep everybody outside of the lab safe. Um, and a final one, and this is actually really important, and I get this, this would always really surprise people when I would talk to, to groups that work in labs every day, they don't realize this is the case, but um, you can't recirculate any air in a lab. And so it's, it's one of those things that you don't think about until you think about it, right? But it, it makes sense. You don't know if there's toxins in the air. You don't want to necessarily just pass it through a HEPA filter the way you would for a regular office space. But what that means is when we're sitting here in Boston and it's seven degrees outside that the building is having to take seven degree air, take it inside, heat it, humidify it, condition it, pump it into your room, just for it to be in your room for a few minutes because you're changing it over so, so quickly. So for, for all of these reasons, and really, again, I could go into them um, so much more in detail, but just the air moving around in a laboratory space, which is, you know, inherently very invisible <laughs> is a huge reason that that labs themselves are um, are energy hogs. So um, chemical hoods is something I'm gonna just touch on for just a second. And so again, um, <laughs> if you're all in person, it's like raise your hand if you even like know what a chemical fume hood is, but just, you know, I'll kind of blindly go into it for a few minutes. You've probably seen one at some point, if not worked in one, um, but, Generally speaking, fume hoods have to operate with a face velocity of um, 60 to 80 feet per minute. And what that means is like the air coming by you, like you're standing in front of the hood and the air coming past you into the hood is going at a certain rate. Again, to make sure if anything's dangerous around, it goes, it's not coming back out at you. It's going up the hood, out the stack, away from you. Um, there are generally speaking two kinds of hoods, continuous air volume and variable air volume. Continuous is just what it sounds like. It's just like a big vacuum cleaner being turned on in the side of your um, building and it's just constantly sucking through the same amount of air all the time. Those are terrible, obviously. Like you can imagine that that's bad for, <laughs> for energy reasons and those are often being converted over to variable air volume hoods. So um, the way those work is, is as you shut the sash, um, it, it knows it has a valve up in the ceiling that knows to decrease um, the flow rate so that the, the phase velocity stays the same through that smaller smaller area, but it, it doesn't need to pull quite as much um, quite as much air up the stack. So that's a really um, that's a really important thing and the fact that so many, so many more um, hoods are this kind is why there are so many, like almost every university at, at some point has had like a shut the sash campaign. So, um, it, you know, in, encouraging researchers to shut the sash, you'll see that, well, there's our, our sticker down at MIT that we had on, on the corner of all the stickers and all of the hoods, making sure everybody knew to shut the sash. Um, so I, I am gonna touch really quickly on this um, project we did at MIT. And again, I'm sorry if this seems very um, overly specific, but if you have anything to do with hoods, it's a really good um, project and a good thing to keep in mind. So um, a bunch of students at one point basically designed, um, designed a device that would detect whether someone was in front of the hood. And if you're, if you're working in front of the hood, it's fine, it's not alarming at you. But as soon as you walk away, if you walk away and you leave the sash open for more than a couple of minutes, it starts beeping at you, which um, this is always really funny because when I've, when I've explained this to people who don't work in a lab all the time or aren't scientists, like a lot of times the, the reaction is just like, well, that seems really obvious. Why, why wouldn't hoods already have that? Why wouldn't have somebody already come up with that and worked on that? And um, there's a, a lot of reasons. I think a lot of answers to, to why that hasn't happened. Um, scientists don't like being bugged when they're in the lab. You know, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. But, um, but regardless, this, this was pretty, um, 
innovative at the time. So what I wanna show you is just a really quick um, visual of, of what happens when you do alarm at people, <laughs> when you do tell them that they need to, to shut their sash. So what you're looking at this, this graph um, essentially is the hood um, position over time. So the, the y-axis being the percent that the hood is open and this is over a month's time. Do you guys actually, can you see my mouse moving? Is that, yeah, okay, good. Um, so this, we, we are able to get this because of like, we had a, a pretty nice building management system in a lot of our buildings at MIT. So this isn't something that just every building has by default, but um, but so you can see here, here's like a, a, a hood where somebody has left it over 50% open for over half of the month. Um, and again, when you think about this being a variable air volume hood, this is literally just like wasting energy for absolutely no reason. Somebody's just walked, to, it's the same thing as like walking away with your refrigerator door open and, but people aren't thinking of it that way because hoods are these like, you know, air is invisible and you don't feel the energy being wasted. So people tend to be very, very sloppy with their hoods. Um, so this is that same hood after um, after we put the mash alarm in. So you can see now you get spikes where if somebody, they use it really just for a few minutes at a time and then shut it all the way because they're, they're getting alarmed at if they don't shut it. And then if we, um, if we expand that, this is just six hoods that um, happen to be in the same room for our first pilot. Um, it's really, really incredible the the amount of time that it cut down on these hoods being um, being open and energy being wasted all of the time. So um, again, I have lots and lots of detailed presentations on all of this. It's it's a little bit hard to actually ascribe very specific energy and or dollar amounts to what you're saving when it comes to air. Um, I'll just say that it's hard and leave it at that. But um, it. We, we roughly calculated that this could save um, about $1,500 a year per hood um, based on this kind of, of usage pattern. Um, and more importantly, I'll, I'll come back to this again at a different point, but it keeps people safe. Like you're supposed to be working in a fume hood because you're doing something that could potentially harm you. And if you leave it open, um, you're not being safe. So, um, so that was my dive on hoods. Sorry if it was too much information for you, maybe. <laughs> maybe a good amount. Um, plug load is another big area that, that laboratories waste um, waste energy. So um, in a nutshell, it's just the things that you plug into your walls when you're in a lab. Um, so again, it depends highly on what kind of lab you are working in. That can be everything as simple as a hot plate to there was a lab at MIT that had a cloud machine, which I still don't quite understand what it was doing, but you know, so it can be all kinds of equipment, but they really do pull a lot of energy and often more than more than you think they will. Um, so again, just to pull from some of the data that we would get um, during my time at MIT, we had a pretty cool program. I will say this program drove me bonkers at the time because it was a little finicky and hard to get some of this data, but um, we had a program where we could go in and, and just monitor um, individual equipment to, again, look for look for use patterns. So this is wattage pulled over time of you know, a couple incubators, a chiller, chiller a bioreactor, a um, biosafety cabinet, and a spectrophotometer. So somewhat uh, typical lab equipment. And so again, you can just, it's its one of these things where people, um, this chiller is a really good example. I put this up here for this chiller because this was just, it's like a little, um, if you haven't worked with one, it's like a, basically a metal box full of water that sits in the corner that you use sometimes. And it's very easy to forget about it and just leave it on in the corner. And then you don't realize that it's pulling these massive amounts of watts all day, every day, just to stay cold, stay cold over in the corner for absolutely no reason. So again, this is, it's, I won't say that it's feasible and likely to get this kind of information and feedback for like every single lab. Um, you know, it, it, maybe one day in the future and depending on the, the resources of the lab, but it, it really does help people. This would always give lab members a really great visual of like, oh gosh, I had no idea that this this piece of equipment was was wasting so much energy. So um, it was something that we, we showed um, pretty frequently. Oh gosh, sorry, I forgot that these were, I, I warned the, <laughs> warned you guys I was gonna forget about my, um, 
my uh, animations. But anyhow, th so those that's just the kind of um, the kind of information we'd give back to them, some sort of comparative analysis. Um, and then UL2 freezers, again, just a, a real quick um, sort of blip about those. Depending on the kind of lab you're in, you may or may not use these, but um, they're often called minus 80 um, freezers, and they are huge energy hogs. They often, um, one freezer uses about the same amount of energy as like two entire normal American households there, because again, they're not, it's not keeping your grapes cold. It's keeping things at minus 80 degrees Celsius it uses a ton of energy. But um, if you do use these or um, come across them in your time in a lab, um, making the set point from minus 80 to minus 70 actually saves up to 30% of the energy. It's not like a linear path how these things use energy they it, it's just not linear I'll say that but um so chilling up the set point using new models making sure you don't have any dead space by stacking gel packs in the empty space um and then also make, you can put alarms and um, different systems there to to keep you updated on the the temperature door openings so um so that's my deep dive into energy again could have talked about energy a lot more in a lot more ways, but we're gonna move on to waste and labs. Um, so the main ways that we waste, with, that we create waste, um, physical waste in labs are consumables and then chemicals and, and reagents. So um, it's important to touch a little bit on recycling here again, because like I, like I sort of hinted at in the, in the beginning, recycling is, by far and away the first thing that people raise their hands about and get excited about. And recycling is definitely still a valid option. There are new cool recycling options every day, but it's important to understand the actual um, actual options and the limitations for recycling, especially after 2018. Um, if you were keeping up with sustainability at all, there was a big um, sort of wrench in the spokes where China decided they didn't want our trash anymore. Basically, we, we were sending them very, very dirty, disgusting junk and just saying, here you go, recycle it. And they didn't want that anymore. So they started cracking down on what they would accept. And as a, as a result, we didn't have a place to send any of our stuff anymore. So in, in a lot of, and so this didn't at all, by any means, only affect labs, this affected everyone. But um, so for a lot of people, you know, maybe you used to be able to take your um, your media bottles, which basically look like a plastic water bottle and toss them in the regular recycling and recycling people would take it and they would go get mixed in with Coke bottles and whatnot. And then they, they started cracking down very heavily on anything that looked like um, scientific or medical waste is like absolutely not. If that's in the if that's in the truck, the whole truck gets thrown out. They were very, very strict about it. So um, just something to keep in mind. I'm not saying that this is something that any of us have any like real effect on at this point, but, um, and also wish cycling. This is actually a picture from a tour we did at a Casella recycling plant, which if you ever get the chance to do that as part of like a sustainability initiative, I think it's a really um, eye-opening experience. Eye-opening and nose closing. They are very smelly places, generally speaking. But um, it's a, this is just a pile, a picture of one of the piles in there that of stuff that people toss into recycling, thinking like, oh, I, I can probably recycle that, right? Like my old box fan, that's probably fine. And like, no, of course not. Casella is not is not set up to to take your box fan. They are very specific about wanting, you know, plastic bottles, cardboard, all of these things, and and there's a reason for that. So um, again, just something that's not even a lab specific. Um, little notation there, but just something to keep in mind. Um, as far as labs are concerned, um, so it it is really, again, like everything here, it's, it's a complicated conversation as to how to um, address it because um, single use plastic is kind of the norm at this point in scientific research. It really wasn't until somewhat recently, people used to not trust plastic and only wanted to use um, reusable glassware. Unfortunately, we're not at all at that case anymore. Everyone wants things that are just like single use, wrapped up, sterilized, use that pipette tip once to pipette 10 microliters of water and throw it away. And that's, um, 
that's really where like that first statistic I gave about how this industry is the one industry with plastics growing. Like that's the reason we have so much single use um, disposables. So we did a few waste audits at my time in MIT too. And um, yeah, this is just one picture of the many just buckets and piles and bags of these single, these aren't even the tips themselves. These are just something that holds the tips for a brief moment in time. So it's important to, to know, you know, get out there, know your options, like talk to your sales reps, talk to people who are in, in the know. Um, there absolutely are reusable boxes where you can like buy the tips and reload them into a box. Um, there are, well, actually I won't go too much into that because I think I'm gonna list those in a few slides, <laughs> sorry. But, um, you know, just, just keeping some of these points in mind, like so things that have less packaging or reusable packaging, um, biodegradable or plant-based materials, and then um, also locally sourced. So, um, you know, there might be somebody who's got, uh, you know, pile of cell culture plates that they aren't going to use anyways, like try and try and use those before buying, buying your own. Um, hazardous waste, so, so chemicals, that's the other, um, one of, I said, one of the other main sort of waste streams that come out of a lab. And it's funny because this tends to be sort of a lab members will think of it almost like a bit untouchable in a way um, because it's there's there's a lot of safety like overarching safety protocols and regulations about waste and you um, so it's more just kind of like all right dump your stuff in that bucket and and don't think about it but um, but if you study the green chemistry um, guidelines and there are I'll I'll come back to them later but there's a great company called Beyond Benign um, there are a lot of resources for designing your experiment and just sort of designing your lab space in general to not need as many chemicals as, as you might have thought you needed. Um, that's really important. And then also um, just doing, doing your best to not um, just simply waste chemicals. Cause at all, I mean, I've, I've worked at both Harvard and MIT and I will just say so many labs will buy a whole bottle of some chemical just because that's easier and then use a tiny bit and then it sits on a shelf and you eventually and when it expires you don't toss it in the trash it's not like your expired eggs in your fridge it has to go through a whole process with the um, hazardous waste team and, and it ends up in these you know being shipped across the country and back and in these um, you know buried underground in these huge tubs and it's just um, I think generally speaking with waste we we like to be a little bit um, blissfully ignorant and hands off and like, oh, I just, I put it in the bin and now the, the magical recycling fairy is going to come take that and, and make something new out of it. Or it's, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind. And it's really important with hazardous waste to, to not do that. Um, one thing I will say, I, again, this is something where I have 20 more slides I should, <laughs> could have shown you, but um, something that I thought was really interesting to learn at one point, if you, so organic waste, um, it's really important to keep halogenated organic waste apart from regular organic waste. Um, so anything that's brominated, chlorinated, et, et cetera, needs to stay separate from regular organics because if you have regular organics that aren't contaminated, they actually take those and they use it as fuel to burn some of these, um, these rotary injectors. Um, I should have left this slide on here because it's a really crazy cool looking thing. It's basically like a huge turnstile with like fire injecting and it's what they pour the, the chemicals through to burn them off to make to, to basically, um, um, what, what, what do I, what, what word do I want to use here? But um, to get rid of them, right? <laughs> to, to make them no longer hazardous materials, you burn them and then, and then catch any um, ash or off gas. But um, so yeah, keep keeping things separate, you know, doing what your safety team tells you to do has has more implications than just safety. Um, where am I? One, three, okay. So I, I'm not gonna go into these by any means. Um, I will just say that unconventional recycling options do exist. So there are ways to recycle your gloves. Um, whether or not that's the right thing to do a little bit remains on the fence. Um, we did a life cycle analysis, which um, some you're probably uh, familiar to extent with what those are um, on whether, you know, the greenhouse gas impact of recycling gloves. And there's um, 
the answer is complicated. I'll leave it at that. But there, there certainly are options to recycle your gloves or buy compostable options. Um, so really keeping this in mind, if you're in a lab, don't just always operate by the status quo, like go out there and, and see, what's, see what's available to be greener. Um, so, okay, so safety and sustainability. This is again, a topic that is so inherently important to, to really um, to think about, but um, I don't know that, so we obviously don't have a whole lot of time to talk about it here. I will say my, my colleague Star Scott at the University of Georgia does a fantastic presentation about this. Um, and if you ever want to have somebody talk about this topic, um, reach out to her, she's, she's great. So um, safety, like any, any organization, any university that has any kind of laboratory or you know, human facing component, you have some sort of an EHS safety department. That's, that's a given. Sustainability at this point is not by any means um, a given. It, but it's becoming more and more common, luckily, and we can all be thankful for that. Um, but it's interesting because these two, these two groups are often thought of having these very like um, head-to-head -head competing principles. So like safety is like the whip and sustainability are the, the carrot, the, oh, hey, don't you want to do this? I have this cool program. And then, you know, regulations versus engaging people and, you know, enforcing and rules and punishment versus rewarding people. Um, they safety is thought of as as um, motivating with fear versus sort of um, other engagement. Um, so it's what I want to say here. Like again, I we, this this is this could be a really deep dive if you wanted. But um, the important thing to think about when you when you're looking at um, any two departments in any organization is that there are always always overlaps, there are always um, goals that you're going to actually um, agree on. And if you can if you can find those goals and if you can talk to each other, um, you're gonna be in a much better place. So I have worked in enough positions and enough organizations to see way too often, um, you know, one, one person in one, um, <laughs> one sort of, department will just basically make assumptions about what they think the other department is going to react like you know they say oh you know they'll hate that because they hated this other thing a couple years ago or oh they're just doing that because they want to look good to the administration or whatever and, and if you can get together and talk so like forming forming interdepartmental working groups um this this really goes above just sustainability or just safety but if sustainability if, if you can generally speaking, just get people together and talk about your, your common goals, why, why you wanna try a project, why you think something is important. Um, you're gonna have a lot more luck than just trying to like go it alone in your own little bubble and then feel like you're, you're competing against another bubble. Um, so for the safety and sustainability factors, for example, um, some things like if you wanted to do air change rate reductions in a lab, um, a lot of people now will will go down to even as low as two or three air change rates um, if you can prove the lab is not occupied. Um, you have to get EHS buy-in from that. You can't just go to facilities and say, "Hey, please turn down the air change." Like it doesn't doesn't work that way. Same with glove or solvent recycling. You're going to have to get them on your side. So it's it's good to have a um, a good relationship. Similarly, um, sustainability can very much help, um, whether it's safety or facilities or any other kind of administrative aspect, they can, they can help you be that, that carrot and that um, engagement aspect and say, you know, here are some reasons that you want to, to separate your hazardous waste or shut your sash, like here are the, the reasons to do that apart from just the, the regulation. So um, just something to keep in mind. And, and now I'm going to go through real quick my cheesy cartoon montage, which I made so many years ago, but I was really proud of, and I think it's funny. So, um, and again, this this makes more sense to people who, who work in labs a lot, but um, I always thought to myself, what if you, I would go into labs and be like, would you do this at home all the time? And they'd be like, oh, you're right, I wouldn't. So at home, you would not leave on your heat and leave your window open at the same time. Um, that would be silly, right? But all the time in labs, people, you, you kind of check out, you're not at home, you're not paying the electricity bill anymore, you're in a different mindset. And so leaving the sash open is 
the same thing, but worse. You're, you're sucking all that nice air and forcing the, the building to try and compensate for it. So that's why sometimes labs are freezing hot all over the place. Um, so something to keep in mind there. Same thing if you were at home, you, um, I, I am assuming you likely don't leave a bunch of kitchen appliances on for days and days and days at a time, just because you might use them at some point. That would be ridiculous, right? My oven's not in there on in my kitchen right now, just in case I, I want to make dinner in six hours. But um, we do that all the time in lab, again, because it's not our electricity bill. It's We've kind of checked out of the process. So um, again, like making sure that you have a process or even some equipment or um, like platforms to help you uh, turn off or, or put equipment into standby is, is very important. Um, this, oh God, this is so outdated. I remember I had a grad student tell me at the time, I was like, what do people play for video games now? And now it's been a long time and I bet this is not even a video game people play. But, um, and, and this is probably the weakest example because I bet there are a lot of people that keep video games for a really long time. But at the same time, we don't just keep, you know, junk in the corner forever that we don't use. You know, it's you, you give it to the thrift store, you sell it on marketplace, you say, I don't use this anymore, someone else might use it. Labs tend to be very bad about that, especially academic labs. <clears throat> Again, this, this applied very heavily to when speaking to academic labs, but they tend to hang on to things until they are completely obsolete. Don't do that. There are great Sorry, <clears throat> great organizations that you can donate your your um, your equipment to. I'll talk about one in a second. Um, so just just keep all of these things in mind. And now that was the end of my cheesy montage. I'm almost done. I think I'm okay on time. So um, just to spend a couple minutes on what I do now, which is no longer you know some version all of all of those other slides and all of that information for academic labs. I um. I work on an ordinance in the city of Cambridge that is um, any minute now, we are like embroiled in the, the sort of amendment process as we speak, but any minute now will be amended to um, have, incorporate building performance standards, which is a little bit um, kind of a new buzzword. Um, a lot of Biden's Build Back Better um, programs incorporate things like this, but um, it basically telling a building you can't just emit all the energy you want. You can't burn natural gas without converting to electricity. You have to you have to reduce your emissions over time um, so that the city or the municipality can can reach net zero emissions. So Cambridge's goal is net zero emissions by 2050, and um, over 80 percent of our emissions in the city come from buildings. Um, and many of them, so so the reason I'm in this project, so many of them are laboratory buildings. Um, you might just know this offhand, but Cambridge, Boston is a, like really in a lot of ways, the foremost hub for biotech at this point. It's it's just bonkers. You go down to Kendall Square and it's new, new lab building every five minutes. So um, so hope this, this ordinance and the amendments to this ordinance are hopefully going to work with other state and local policy to encourage these large buildings to do some of the stuff in these previous slides. A lot of this stuff seems like small potatoes, seems like, oh, it's just something that a, an individual lab person might do, but it really does add up to using less energy and therefore less emissions over time. So a um, little snippet on Buto. Again, if you ever have any questions about that stuff, I can happy to happy to help if you wanna reach out. Um, and just to wrap it up, so Cambridge Sustainable Labs is a group that I started um, uh, yeah, I guess at least five years ago now at, um, at MIT. And it's, um, we just have a lot of local organizations that get together from, you know, all the big, big biotechs, medium-sized biotechs, startups, universities, everyone, we get together and talk about um, strategies, programs, platforms um, to, to save, save energy and save resources. And um, it's, it's been really exciting. So if any of you have any um, you know, interest, or if you're you're affiliated with some sort of a lab or biotech research um, organization, um, you know, feel free to to use the link and sign up. We'd love to have you. I think we have like, I mean, it it's even I think like 190 something today. We we get a lot of new members on the daily <laughs> lately. So um, lab sustainability is a very very popular subject. So um, so come on over if you're interested.
And um, I just wanted to, again, I could talk about each of these, these organizations in detail, but just if you want to jot them down, someone to look into, um, th these are great resources for, um, for learning more or, or maybe, um, you know, looking into certain, certain options for your lab or your space. And I'll just leave it with this slide. I think this is the slide I would always leave it with with MIT. I was always very proud of my Captain Planet that I put gloves on and <laughs> just leave it there. But um, so just to remind you of the, the things that you can do. And I think I will, um, I will end it there. So are we good on time? Yes, fantastic. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That awesome. was a very interesting presentation.